Okay, so in the last lecture I had stopped here where I described this diagram uh, which shows how a, a piece of uh, an elastic material in two dimension uh, would deform under the application of uh, stress. So that means that it is going to um, exhibit uh, what is called strain and strain is described as the displacement of uh, the various points in the elastic material in a very non-linear way. Okay, so I have explained to you uh, what is the meaning of the various uh, terms in this strain tensor. So this epsilon ij was my strain tensor. So I explained to you that the diagonal components uh, tell you how the size of the uh, of a piece of material of an elastic material changes under the application of stress. So the diagonal elements like epsilon xx, epsilon yy, epsilon zz would correspond to the how much the size changes. Um, whereas uh, epsilon xy, epsilon yz and so on, they the off diagonal ones tell you and that is called the shear strain and that tells you how the shape of the uh, of that piece of material changes. So under the application of stress the strain that uh, appears in the elastic body also um, uh, means has two, uh, two aspects to it. One aspect is that it changes the size of, the, of that uh, piece of the elastic body and it also changes the shape. So and these uh, two are captured by uh, this uh, strain tensor. Okay, so now uh, I told you also that uh, we will be focusing or restricting our attention to what are called linear elastic materials and linear elastic materials are those where the strain tensor is proportional to the stress tensor. So now uh, we are going to implement that in a somewhat uh, less obvious way uh, and, and for reasons that will become clear uh, soon because uh, you see you, you will actually need uh, two uh, coefficients. So I am going to describe to you what they are. So I am going to uh, say that my strain tensor, so for a linear elastic material my strain tensor, so this is my strain tensor for a linear elastic material my strain tensor is proportional to the stress tensor. So you see notice that uh, you might be thinking that why did I not stop here, so I should have simply uh, done this. Well the reason uh, will become clear soon because uh, there are two things that happen uh, and one is that uh, when you apply uh, stress an elastic object will, uh, suppose you stretch a, stretch a rubber band, the rubber band will increase its length in the direction in which you are stretching it but it will also decrease its length in the perpendicular direction. So you actually need two, uh, two numbers to describe what is happening. So these are, these are two independent things that, uh, that the amount by which you stretch and uh, the amount by which the material compresses in the perpendicular direction can be different and they can be completely independent. So that is the reason why you need two different uh, uh, coefficients to describe it. So, so bottom line is that you can uh, ensure linearity, see oh, I told you linear elastic materials are those uh, whose uh, strain is proportional to stress. So instead of doing it the obvious way which is epsilon ij equals a times epsilon ij, uh, so this would uh, unnecessarily constrain ourselves to material, very uh, peculiar type of materials. So if you want to be more general, you add a term which is also proportional to stress and, and this is basically the trace of this matrix and then you put a Kronecker delta here. So the reason why this is done is uh, because firstly epsilon ij will remain symmetric and secondly uh, it is linear in the sense that if you double the stre stress, uh, the strain also doubles. So it is linear. So now I am going to tell you why we needed this both these A and B, uh, why we could not uh, do with just A which would have been the obvious choice. See the reason is that, uh, so imagine 
imagine that there is only one component of stress, so namely epsilon xx. So that means you apply stress in the x direction and, uh, and that's, uh, in other words you apply a force uh, perpendicular to the uh, yz surface okay? and that is it and everything else is 0. So in that case the material will expand, suppose you stretch it in the x direction, it will uh, expand in the x direction but it will compress in the y and z directions because that is typically what we our intuition tells us and what our uh, experience also tells us. So in that case, uh, so let us try and see uh, what that means uh, to, uh, means uh, how does that um, connect to this, uh, this assumption or answers we made here. So, so now if you uh, set i and j to both to be equal to x, then you see you get this uh, equation which basically tells you that, uh, so I told you that there is only sigma yy equals sigma zz equals everything else equals 0. So everything is 0 except sigma xx. So in which case sigma, uh, which trace of sigma is also sigma xx. Uh, so, which is uh, sigma without any subscript is basically the trace of sigma matrix. But since the only element there is sigma xx, the trace is sigma xx itself. So, you see you have this uh, sigma xx and then you have this sigma xx because of i equals j. And then you will, you have this relation that is uh, epsilon xx is a plus b times sig sigma xx. But now if you look at sigma yy, you see that uh, epsilon yy is basically because sigma yy is now 0. So, so now it will just be b times sigma xx. So now you see sigma yy and sigma um, zz are uh, basically b times the applied stress. See whereas uh, sigma xx is a plus b times the applied stress okay, and all others are 0 because the shear so uh, there is no chance of any shear strain because there is no shear stress in the material. So this is all, this is the whole story. So now the question is uh, we can now uh, uh, make some statements about what the physical meaning of these coefficients a and b are, the small letter a and small letter b. So the answer is the following that you define something called Young's modulus and Young's modulus is defined as the, uh, the stress. Uh, sigma xx which you have applied divided by the strain, okay, so that is called Young's modulus. So, the, so in other words the stress that you have applied and the strain in the same direction in which you have applied, so it is sigma xx divided by epsilon xx, so that is called Young's modulus. Whereas uh, there is another coefficient which tells you, so you see uh, this Young's modulus basically tells you uh, how much the elastic object stretches or compresses in the same direction in which you have applied the stress. But whereas the other one, this is equation 4.12, it tells you the uh, amount by which the elastic material stretches or compresses in the direction perpendicular to the applied stress. So you see, uh, I told you if you take a rubber band. Uh, so imagine a re uh, reasonably thick rubber band and you st stretch it uh, in the usual way with your fingers, then it is uh, going to increase its length in the same direction in which you are stretching it. Whereas if you look closely, you will see that the thickness of the rubber band has actually reduced because you have stretched it. So that is what this second relation tells you, it is basically what is called Poisson ratio. So Poisson's ratio is, tells you the, uh, the ratio of the amount by which the elastic body has compressed in the perpendicular direction and the amount by which it has stretched in the original direction. So that ratio is basically called Poisson ratio and that is unrelated to Young's modulus. So that is the reason why you needed these two different parameters called small letter a and small letter b because now we are in a position to relate these two seemingly ad hoc uh, parameters coefficients which we introduce namely small letter a and small letter b to more physical quantities such as Young's modulus and Poisson ratio. Okay, so it is easy to do that because we already have these relations 
and when you do that you get uh, this relation that is B comes out as uh, the ratio of the Poisson, Poisson ratio and the uh, Young's modulus. Poisson ratio divided by Young's modulus with a minus sign is your B whereas uh, um, 1 plus Poisson ratio divided by Young's modulus is A. So, you put that in and you get this very important relation which tells you the relation between stress in a material uh, and the strain that you apply. So, if you have a linear elastic material you apply stress called sigma ij the material is going to exhibit strain which is described by a tensor epsilon ij and the parameters that you have to specify to describe this is there are two parameters one you have to specify the Young's modulus that tells you the amount by which uh, the size of the material changes and uh, indirectly the Poisson ratio tells you the amount by which the shape of the material changes. Okay, so now uh, we are going to see how to apply this uh, stress strain relation to find the uh, you know how, how a body deforms. So, there are, there are very many interesting uh, things you can do with this uh, relation. For example, you take an elastic, uh, take a for example, a ball made of solid rubber and you just place and imagine that is a relatively heavy ball and you just simply place it on a table. It is uh, so if you, if you just hold it in your hand it is uh, like a perfect sphere, but if you place it on a table it is going to press on to the table because of its weight and it is not going to look like a sphere anymore. It will look like more or less a sphere, but not exactly a sphere. So, it is going to deform under its own weight. So, we want to know, so this subject uh, teaches you how to find uh, the shape of the rubber ball, uh, the solid rubber ball uh, when it is placed on the surface of a table for example. So, these are the kinds of interesting things you can do with uh, this, these types of uh, relations like 4.16. So, I am going to teach you certain very standard methods to solve for these shapes uh, under the application of known stresses. So, first let us assume that the, uh, the body forces, so remember I told you that just like you know if you have a rubber ball which is a, like a sphere the body forces typically refer to the weight of the rubber ball. So, the, uh, the weight per unit volume as it were. So, you assume that uh, it is derivable from a potential, so it is a conservative force a weight. So, there is a potential energy V and negative gradient of that is the force. So, if, if that is the case then clearly you can, uh, you can see that the, remember I told you divergence of sigma plus F B is 0. So, that is basically tells you that uh, this is, uh, so the, th this relation just tells you that divergence of sigma is uh, grad B, okay. So, that is what I have done here. So, divergence of sigma equals grad B. So, I have just uh, assumed that uh, you have a two dimensional material with two dimensional body forces and uh, you have applied a stress, but then uh, you have applied a stress and the body forces and the kind of balance of so that the overall the material does not accelerate it just deforms. So, now uh, I am going to consider a special case where the uh, material uh, you know the gravity acts in the y direction, okay. So, as a result you have a negative y direction. So, as a result your potential energy density is rho g y, okay. Uh, so, now if that is the case then you can clearly see that uh, you can integrate these uh, these relations. So, these relations can be integrated in this way. So, the reason why you can do this is that you can introduce a function called phi x y and you can see that these substitution if you substitute this into this equation it is going to be an identity, okay. So, you can you can verify that yourself. So, now the question is that we have to uh, solve for phi. So, this, this is like kinematics you know what in, uh, in classical dynamics we would, we would have called this kinematics. It is just a, it is just a substitution which solves for certain equations. But then you have to uh, invoke the dynamics which is a stress strain relation in order to actually find that phi and therefore get explicitly the strain, okay. 
So, uh, so this is the applied stresses, right? So, this is the applied stresses. So, these two, uh, okay, what these two together ensure is that the system, system is in, uh, system does not accelerate. So, that means it simply deforms. So, these two ensure that this because the body forces are compensated by the stresses. So, they do not accelerate, so the material, no part of the material accelerates, they just deform and remain in equilibrium. So, now the question is uh, how does, now the important question is the, now that uh, we have figured out that there is a uh, well defined uh, way in which the strain or rather the stress is related to the body forces given by this. So, the question is uh, what does this mean when it comes to describing the strain in the material. Okay, first we, we use the definition of the uh, strain tensor in terms of the displacements. So, remember that epsilon xx is defined as the uh, rate of change of uh, the displacement in the x direction with respect to x. Similarly, epsilon yy is the uh, rate of change of displacement in the y direction with respect to y and xy is the, uh, is the you know the democratic mean of uh, the dis derivative with respect to x and y and y with y and x you know because remember that it was basically alpha plus beta. See the reason why it is alpha plus beta you might be wondering why did I select alpha plus so remember what is alpha and beta these two is the sum of these two angles divided by 2. So, that was epsilon x y was alpha plus beta by 2. So, you might be wondering that why did I not only select this one. Firstly, it is not symmetric if I do not do that, but then you might think that why is it important for it to be symmetric. See the reason is because uh, look alpha is defined like this, beta is defined like this. Now, if beta is uh, equal to minus alpha, what this means is this, this square actually uh, does not deform, it simply rotates. See beta is minus alpha, what does that mean? That means this uh, this square has actually not changed the shape at all, it has simply rotated in, in anti-clockwise, is not it? So, then we do not want to consider that like a, we do not want to think of that as a strain. We only want to think of it uh, as a strain only when the, uh, that shape actually changes. If it simply rotates, we do not want to consider that as strain. So, that is the reason why we do alpha plus beta by 2 because if alpha equals minus beta, it is a simple rotation without changing shape. So, it is not as therefore a strain, so it is just a rotation. So, now that is out of the way, let us uh, proceed and uh, you can see that because of this definition, this identity is always valid. So, this is called the compatibility condition. Okay. So, this is just comes from the definition of epsilons in terms of the displacements. Okay. So, now uh, keep in mind that uh, we have said that the normal strain, so, so remember that the normal strain in the z direction is 0 because we are thinking of plane strain. Okay. So, there is no strain in the z direction. So, therefore, the stresses in the z direction if they exist should be given by this relation. Okay. So, the, we assume that the strains take place in the plane, the x y plane only. So, in that case you can now go ahead and uh, find out the uh, components of the strain tensor and you will, so from the stress strain relation you can uh, deduce these, uh, these results. Okay, so, the uh, epsilon x x will be proportional to uh, a combination of x, uh, sigma x x and sigma y y and uh, epsilon x y will be pro directly proportional to sigma x y. So, in other words the, uh, the shear strain is proportional to the shear stress, whereas the, um, the normal strain is proportional to uh, the normal stress. So, the normal stress in the normal strain in the x direction is not only proportional to the normal strain in the x direction, but it is there is also a part of it which is proportional to the normal strain in the y direction. I told you why that is. Well, if you if you try to stretch something in one direction, it compresses in the perpendicular direction. So, both get mixed up. 
okay so and uh, so now we go ahead and substitute these two relations or these three relations into this compatibility identity so this compatibility identity uh, forces this to be valid okay so now uh, yeah it's a long story so what we have to do is that we have to eliminate the shear stress from this and see if we can only write the uh, normal stress and the body forces because now so this is the compatibility condition gives you one constraint on the various components of the um, stresses that you have applied but then remember that uh, there are also uh, uh, conditions which tells you the, how the stresses are related to the body forces okay so now if you go ahead and combine these two you will see that uh, so if you uh, if you take 4.18 okay that's what this was so if if you just uh, take these relations okay and then combine it with the 4.28 so what you're going to get is basically this relation okay and uh, if you go ahead and combine this uh, mixed partial derivative of the uh, so you substitute uh, this formula of the sh shear strain into 4.28 okay so you just substitute that here and you will see that uh, so it's a lot of algebra okay so i am not going to uh, describe to you all the steps because then it's it will be quite uh, distracting and boring so but uh, you just have to work it out on your own and uh, because all the steps are explicitly given so you just have to follow the logic so now once you do that then you will see that uh, this is the equation that you finally get and then if you go ahead and eliminate the sigmas the components of sigma and express it in terms of this uh, this phi so this is reminiscent of uh, this uh, you know writing the electric field in terms of scalar and vector potentials so that's similar to what we do in electromagnetic theory we write uh, so this is something like a potential function for the stress so we have introduced a kind of potential function so in fact that's called the stress function that's why it's called the stress function method so that's the so it's the analog of uh, scalar and vector potentials so so that uh, stress function now obeys a certain equation namely this so this is this is the body force uh, potential energy and this is your stress function so if you know the stress function you also can find the stress just by this this relation so if you find phi then you can just substitute here you know all the stresses if you know all the stresses you also know all the strains because you have the stress strain relation which tells you tells you all the strains okay so now you have so this is a very general result okay 3 4.31 is very general so now the question is uh, when body forces are absent or if they are constants then you can clearly see that the stress uh, the stress function of base is uh, you know double laplace equation okay so rather than solving this we can just uh, postulate that we can try out certain forms of phi xy so let's uh, try out arbitrarily if uh, if phi xy was were this what does it correspond to so j just imagine that there's an object that occupies a region of uh, you know it it occupies this this much region from y equal to d and y equal to so it occupies this region so it occupies x greater than 0 but uh, y is between 0 and d so there is this elastic material here so and then imagine that the, there is a stress function given by this relation so now the question is uh, if the body forces are absent uh, then uh, the stress components are now given by these relations okay so we also have to take into account the fact that um, at x equal to 0 the normal stresses vanish okay so we assume that for example that there is no stress so the normal stress is vanish at x equal to 0 and at y equal to d by 2 because if you set uh, x equal to 0 uh, and uh, you get uh, sigma xx equals 0 
but then if you set uh, y equals d by 2 then also sigma xx is 0. So basically it is saying that the normal stresses that is sigma yy is anyway 0 that, that part of the normal stress is 0. So there is only one other normal stress which is sigma xx and that is 0 whenever x is 0. So that means here there is no normal stress but then uh, there is also no normal stress here along this entire line. So there is no normal stress on this line, there is no normal stress on that line, okay. So uh, yeah, that is just an observation, an interesting observation. The other thing is that regarding shear stresses, there are no shear stresses uh, at the ends. That means that there is no shear stress here, uh, there is no shear stress anywhere here or anywhere here, okay, because that comes from here. So this is not particularly illuminating because it is just an observation from the chosen randomly chosen phi, we have just randomly chosen some phi and we have just said that this is what the stresses induced in the material are going to be. But then uh, it is more illuminating to find say for example the forces acting on say some particular surface like y equal to 0. So if I want to act, uh, know the forces acting on y equal to 0, then uh, what I do is I do sigma dot the normal to that surface, okay. So the normal to that surface would correspond to minus j hat because that would be the inward, no, I mean basically the outward normal to y equal to 0 would be here, like this is the outward normal which is minus j hat because this is my surface, this is my xz plane. So the force acting per unit area on that surface is sigma dot minus j hat. So if you work that out you will see that it is 0 at y equal to 0, okay. So that there is no forces acting on that surface. So similarly at y equal to d also the forces are 0, okay. So what this means is the, that uh, the situation is such that the part of the cross section between 0 and d by 2 is being pushed in the negative x direction, right. So in other words this portion of the material is being pushed in the negative x direction, okay. See whereas this portion of the material is being pushed in the uh, positive x direction, right. So that is what this physically, this peculiar choice of phi corresponds to this situation. So you have to imagine that this is like a 3D thing, I mean it is it's the physics happens in 2D but the material is still 3D. So you are stretching, uh, you are stretching the material in the plus x direction when the points in the material are between y equal to 0 and y equal to d by 2 and you are uh, you're stretching in the negative x direction for the bottom half of the y values and the top half of the y values you are stretching in the positive x direction. So, so it is kind of you are trying to tear that you know that elastic material apart in the x direction as it were. So, so that is what uh, this situation corresponds to. That means somebody is trying to tear this apart by pulling uh, in opposite directions. So that is what this phi corresponds to. Yeah, so typically that is not how the uh, problem description is uh, posed in real life. Somebody is going to tell you what forces, what I am trying to do. So I am going to uh, be told that uh, look, I am trying to tear this apart by pulling this in the x direction this way and negative x direction that way and now tell me what stresses are in the material. So th that is of course the correct way of posing this question but that is a harder question to answer because it involves solving differential equations. So here I have in this example I have done the reverse. I have started with the solution of the differential equation which is completely opaque and uh, very hard to know what, what it is all about, what it corresponds to. So, but then I am going to substitute this absolutely seemingly random choice for that uh, potential stress function and then I substitute in my stress strain uh, all these formulas that I have derived and then I figure out what the stresses induced are and then I infer what that that really corresponds to by looking at the forces acting on particular surfaces. So this is just a pedagogy that is, is just to tell you what is the physics behind these, these relations. So this is just uh, you know interesting examples that 
uh, that get you familiar with uh, the use of stress strain relations and these consistency conditions and so on. So, they, uh, let's go to the another example. So, imagine there is a cuboid that means uh, a kind of a rectangular shaped 3D material with uh, sides L x, L y, L z uh, made of uh, a linear material like this. So, this is the standard, uh, this is the more interesting question rather than just um, you know randomly postulate f i and say that what does this correspond to. Rather than that, we ask ourselves, uh, so imagine that there is an elastic material of a certain uh, shape and then you are holding it in your hand and it does not do anything. But now you just place it on a table and because of its weight, it is going to deform in a certain way and that is precisely what we want to find out, how does it deform. So, this is a more interesting question to ask and answer. So, the body force per unit volume is therefore uh, given by this, it is constant, it is minus mg times k hat. So, we will assume that k hat is the uh, vertical direction and minus k hat is the direction of acceleration due to gravity. So, now uh, you have your uh, relations which uh, the body force, uh, you know, the, the analog of continuity equation in electrodynamics or fluid mechanics uh, which we will come to later, but bottom line is this is basically the equilibrium condition. It tells you um, the forces due to stress have to balance out the body forces, else, else the material will accelerate. Okay. So, that is uh, that's clear what that is. So, now uh, uh, the thing that is clear is that the uh, because you know there are no shear stresses, nobody is trying to change the, uh, so, the so there is no uh, you know forces acting in the x direction uh, and you know sigma x y type of thing is not going to be there because there is no, uh, there is no kind of a rotating kind of stress that is, so because sigma x y is some kind of a torsion type of stress, so somebody is going to actually twisting, so it is basically that is the better word, somebody is trying to twist that material. So, see if sigma x y is non-zero, that means somebody is trying to twist that material, so nobody is trying to twist that material, so there is a, there is an elastic uh, body which is you, it has some weight and you just place it on a table and it is changing its shape. So, nobody is twisting anything. So, all the sigma x y and x z and all those things are 0. So, because of that uh, we can uh, uh, state that basically you have this, uh, this relation that, uh, so therefore all these other ones are 0. So, only this is there. So, because of that you can immediately uh, find out that uh, sigma z z is basically m g by v into z plus constant. But then uh, we are going to assume that uh, at z equal to 0, so we have to assume that at z equal to 0, so that z equal to 0 is the, the force acting on the bottom surface per unit area. So, we have to assume that uh, there is a force acting on the bottom surface per unit area which is basically holding up that material, right? Because uh, you are placing it on the table. So, z equal to 0 is the bottom surface of that material and it is being held up by some forces and that force per unit area is mg divided by Lx into Ly which is the cross section of the portion that is sitting on the table. So, that is the force, uh, so there is therefore there is a stress uh, which is sigma z z that is acting on the bottom and that is that's clearly nothing but minus sigma z z uh, k hat. So, that is the force acting. Uh, so, this should therefore be equal to, so at z equal to 0 it should be this. So, this is going to be m g by uh, L x L y. Okay. So, then uh, so if you combine these two you will get this relation that sigma z z is basically m g divided by L x L y into z by L z minus 1 and all other components of stress vanish identically because you know you have a L x L y L z type of 
rectangularish material which is just sitting on the table and it will simply compress in the z direction. So, uh, so, but then you see even though the strain all the other components uh, vanish, I am uh, sorry the stress all the other components vanish except sigma zz, the strain you know you will have components in y direction also because I told you that if uh, material compresses in the z direction it will expand in the x and y directions. Okay. So, here the material is trying to compress in the z direction. So, that is what we are going to try and find out. So, you see uh, from these relations it is clear that uh, okay, so this is your uh, sigma xx uh, sorry epsilon xx okay, and uh, this is also equal to epsilon yy is going to be this because we know what uh, sigma is, sigma is uh, trace but then all the other sigmas are 0. So, you get this. So, now if you integrate you will uh, you will be able to see that uh, these these integrations will give you all these uh, integration type constants and then you have to also keep in mind that nobody is trying to twist anything. So, all the shear components are 0 and that will basically tell you uh, all, all these uh, unknown constants. So, the integration constants when you are partially differentiating with respect to with respect to z the integration constant could depend on x and y. So, you will have to follow a rather lengthy procedure to find out uh, the various integration constants. Okay, so, I am not going to, so it is just a lot of tedious algebra. So, I am not going to spend too much time on that. Bottom line is that uh, after doing all that this is the full solution. So, this is the uh, amount of displacement. So, remember what u of x is it is the uh, amount by which um, a material um, at point x, y, z has displaced in the x direction. So, that elastic material. So, this will basically tell you uh, what is the final shape of that uh, cubical elastic material of length L x L y x L z when you are um, just uh, placing it on a table and allowing it to deform under its own weight. So, this is very interesting because it uh, tells you how that material has deformed. So, there is a very precise uh, mathematical way in which is it has deformed. So, it is nice to know that it is possible to do this. Okay. So, here uh, for example, in figure 4.3 I have explained uh, uh, how the displacement vectors look like. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately this is in black and white, but uh, in color you will see that uh, uh, you have different uh, you know if you have arrows of the same color they that means they have the same magnitude of the displacement. So, bottom line is that this is what uh, it looks like. So, there is a strain induced displacement. So, you can just uh, you know just try and see if you can visualize this uh, in some way you know use some software like Mathematica or MATLAB to plot, uh, try to visualize the strain, try to plot it in, uh, in 3D and see how that that object will look like physically when you, so the basically this tells you like the exact mathematical way in which uh, an elastic object of length L x L y L z has deformed because you have placed it on a table. So, it is nice to know, I mean nice to create a kind of image of that in 3D uh, using this formula. So, I think uh, I would encourage my listeners to try and do that using some software like Mathematica or MATLAB. So, maybe we can discuss that in one of our tutorials later on. Okay, so, the next uh, example which I am going to quickly discuss is a sphere of mass m and radius r that is strained uh, in a certain way. So, imagine that uh, the displacement is uh, directly proportional to uh, the square of the radius. So, the further away it is from the center the more it strains and the strain is uh, in the, so in other words somebody is trying to compress that sphere and the compression is larger when you are far, further away from the center. Okay. So, there is more displacement in the sense that sphere kind of displaces more further away 
then so it's like you know take a solid rubber ball and try to squeeze it in and so that's what this means so that's what 4.6 means somebody is trying to squeeze a rubber ball from all directions so now the question is what is the uh, strain so here also we don't expect the shear things nobody is trying to twist anything so we expect that to be the case but then remember the geometry is a sphere so uh, so even though nobody is trying to twist anything but because it's a, it's a sphere there are going to be uh, so so we'll have to let the equations play out and we have to decide uh, you know the equations tell us what's going to happen so this is your displacement and if this is your displacement you can figure out all the strain tensors okay and then uh, from there you can get your stress tensors okay so uh, so this is in uh, this is a different kind of question in the sense that somebody has told you what the display usually it's the other way around somebody tells you what body force is acting what stresses are acting and you're supposed to figure out the displacement that's what we did here in the in the earlier question we just found out how the material deforms under its own weight because somebody told you there's a body force there's a stress so uh, whatever it is that uh, uh, if this is the problem description that somebody has told you what the uh, displacement is then we are supposed to find out what are the stresses that are involved which leads to this displacement okay so now you see uh, you can figure out the strain tensor which is going to have all kinds of components okay so now from the stress strain relation you can figure out uh, the uh, suppose you want to figure out the force acting suppose you want to f uh, find out the force acting per unit area in the radial direction okay so what you have to do is first figure out the uh, stress tensor and then because now you can you can figure out the stress tensor just by simply stress strain relation because you already know the strain tensor so from stress strain relation you immediately get this uh, stress tensor so from the stress tensor you can figure out the force acting on any surface so specifically if you choose your unit normal to the surface to be uh, x y z basically some point x y z then you can figure that out and uh, so you'll you'll basically be able to show that the force acting per unit area at any point r is basically uh, proportional to r in, but in the opposite direction to r so in other words that's what i told you somebody is trying to compress so so that's what this means so that uh, there is a force acting per unit area uh, which is proportional to r that means there is more force acting as you go further away from the center and it's kind of symmetrical in the radial it's it's, it's like being compressed from all directions okay so i think uh, well uh, we could keep uh, giving such examples uh, so there is another example involving a disk where okay so this this is a different example where the uh, displacement is in the angular direction uh, but the magnitude is proportional to the radial uh, distance so that means that uh, magnitude wise it is more and more the displacement is more and more as you go further away from a certain center but the displacement is not uh, in the direction of in the radial direction it's exactly perpendicular to that so that's basically somebody is trying to twist that material and they are trying to twist it in such a way that the twist is more when they are further away from a center so now here also you can figure out various uh, uh, various things but then you see uh, so what's going to happen here for this particular example that uh, you will see that uh, the uh, strain tensor vanishes identically as well as the stress tensor so what's going to happen for this particular example so if if the, yeah this is the reason why i have given this example so if uh, if you choose the displacement to be uh, in the angular direction but then the magnitude is exactly uh, proportional to the distance then you will see that the strain tensor and stress tensor strain tensor first vanishes identically and therefore the stress also vanishes identically so that means basically what's happening is that the whole material is getting rotated by a certain amount 
So, uh, so this displacement just corresponds to a simple rotation of the whole material. So, as a result no strain is accumulating in the material and therefore there are no stresses. So, so this, is, uh, this is just to illustrate that just because some displacement happens does not mean there is a strain in the material. So, the displacement can be an overall displacement of the entire material. So, this is an example where you have a 2D material that is not twisting in the, the it is like the different portions of the material are not relatively twisting, the whole thing is twisting together. So, that is just a simple rotation. So, when that happens there is no strain in the material. So, if there is no strain there are no stresses. Okay, so, now I am going to stop here. And in the next class, I will try and explain to you um, certain other approaches, uh, certain other uh, ways of solving for stresses and strains in elastic material. So, this is the earlier method was called the stress function method and there are other methods also depending upon the problem description. So, once we are done with uh, elasticity theory which is what we are discussing now, we will move on to fluid dynamics fluid mechanics basically that corresponds to uh, the description of elastic materials that do not support uh, shear stresses. So, that means that the moment you put a shear stress instead of uh, something compensating and uh, the material coming to an equilibrium, it will actually accelerate right. So, so that is what a fluid is because an elastic medium tries uh, basically it will not accelerate rather it will deform, but a fluid will accelerate if you apply shear stresses. So, that is the big difference. So, I am going to stop here and in the next class I will be discussing uh, some more techniques for understanding elasticity theory followed by uh, fluid mechanics. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.